one constant feeling reigns over the 130 plus year history of NC State Wolfpack football. Hope. And when there's hope, well, Pack fans can always relate. Pack family, time for a true look at your team. Expert analysis, special guests, and a Carter Finley sized bag full of X's and O's. Let's get hooked up for Pack Therapy. Here are your hosts, Tim Donnelly and Wolfpack Rate, Mike Lennon. Welcome back, Pack Therapy Podcast. Myself, Mike Lennon, NC State legend, and now joining us here on the pod, James Henderson, owner and contributor, writer, kind of does it all for Inside Pack Sports. Check him out. Uh, subscribe. Check him out on Twitter at Inside Pack Sport. Uh, and on a bye week, we thought it would, would be a, a good time to get kind of the, the pulse of Wolfpack Nation, and we, and we thought James was a, as good as any to bring in and, and give us that. So, uh, James, we'll, we'll start with this. I was just talking with Mike off air. You guys go way back. He said you one time went up and visited him in high school to, to see what he was bring, putting on the, uh, the field at Westfield High School. What were your first impressions of a young Mike Glennon at Westfield High School? Skinny. skinny. <laughs> I don't feel like you're going to say that. <laughs> yeah, he was skinny, tall and skinny, but man, Mike, you know, Mike could throw it though. Like, you know, obviously it was a no brainer. Um, I saw him at States actually at the You there, James? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to have to start that one over cuz we lost you right out the gate. So we'll just start right over, okay? Hopefully the connection yeah, yeah, holds yeah. up. We good, Graham? All right. Welcome back into Pack Therapy, Pack Therapy Podcast. Myself, Mike Glennon, NC State legend, and now James Henderson, owner Inside Pack Sports. Uh, check him out online, Inside Pack Sports, on Twitter, at Inside Pack Sport. Uh, we wanted to get on a bye week, kind of the pulse of, of Wolf, Wolf Pack Nation. We thought James was a, a, as good as anyone out there to, to provide that for us. Uh, now, this is our take two. We had to restart the, the recording of, of this podcast podcast due to some uh, some connectivity issues but i'm still going to start the same way we started a second ago make you tell the same story uh you and mike go way back you actually visited his high school westfield high school in northern virginia when it was it was obvious he was going to be a future uh nc state quarterback what do you remember about about a young mike glennon i told you he was skinny man tall and skinny <laughs> mike had a lot more hair back then he had, he had the good he had the quaff going uh, you know but but no i saw mike play at state summer camp and i mean he was a no-brainer and uh, obviously it played out that way. I mean, great career at State, great career in college and NFL. So, you know, um, no, not, no surprises. <laughs> no surprises. All right. Well, uh, some surprises through the first part of, of the, the state football season, but it's a bye week. If, if we make you the, the head czar, what, what's your, your bye week to-do list for State? What are the things they got to check off before they get to the second half of their season? Man, they got to figure out a way to score some points, right? Um, I mean, I think I think that's the the big deal for NC State right now is offensively figure out a way to make it a little easier for MJ. You know, the schedule doesn't get easy. I mean, obviously Clemson, Miami, two really good defenses right away. So can you can you put some points together? Because I think we all would probably agree the defense will be good enough or should be to give them an opportunity in those games. So can they find a way to score some points? And speaking of the pulse of NC State fans, you probably see it more than anybody. The message yeah. boards, the probably the highs, highs, and the lows, lows. People love to get on their keyboard and voice their frustrations. What what is the fans kind of the speaking broadly? How seven games through the season? What's their take on how this is going? Well, you know how it goes, Mike. Once you when you start losing, we start talking about what the coach did his first ten years, eleven years, twelve years, right, and start trying to. Uh, to analyze everything about Dave Doran, but I think um, you know, there's probably some, I don't want to say shock is the right word, but, you know, I think there was an expectation. You bring in Brendan Armstrong, things are going to be better than they are, right? And, and so when that didn't work out, um, I think you have some, some reservations and concerns, but it, it always, I'm never shocked. It always turns into a referendum on the head coach once, some, once you start losing, right? We start talking head coach here and, coordinators and and you know what you did for me and um that's really where they're at you know I, I know on our boards a lot of them are talking about Dave and 
what all he's accomplished. And I'm sure if he starts winning a couple games, they'll forget about that and talk about the season. That's kind of how it goes. How how do you see as somebody that's that's been around since since pre Doran? How do you kind of characterize the the you know ten plus years he's led the Wolfpack? I mean, I think Dave's done a good job. I mean, you, you know, it's hard because even on our forums right now, he's being compared to what North Carolina has done, what what Duke has mm-hmm. done. But they're in the Coastal Division. It's a lot different, right? Like, I think – I know me personally, I don't know where you guys are on it. If NC State was in the Coastal Division, they'd have a couple of division titles under Dave Dorn. I think he had a couple of teams good enough to win a Coastal Division title, whether it was 21 or, or back in 17 and 18 when he had Naeem and Finley and, and those guys. Um, so it's hard to make those comparisons. The thing I'll say about Dave where I, I would give him credit is oftentimes as a head coach, you, you maybe rebuild it once, but you rarely do it twice, right? Like you rarely see a guy build it up, it falls apart. And really 2019 was a really bad year for State. But then to build it back up to where in 2020, 21, 2022, State's been really competitive – I think that's the to, the way I would measure him because even if you go back for me, like when I first started covering state, Chuck Amato was the head coach, and and Chuck had those four years with Philip, and then once Philip left, for whatever we thought of Chuck and the program, he never could get it back up. You know, he couldn't. And I know Mike, you saw it with with Tob, like that towards the end of, of of his tenure. You know, your last year. I mean, there was a perception that when Mike left, everything was going to just kind of fall apart and and i mean i guess dave felt the brunt of that right mike i mean you, you know you carry a lot of weight man I mean, he fall, fall down to three or four wins whatever it was in dave's first year as soon as mike left but i think that's how i would sum up dave's tenure is like I, I think you give him credit for multiple rebuilds because frankly a lot of a lot of coaches don't do that they 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 can't get it back up like and, he did and you talk about the rebuild and kind of these classes i feel like what dave's done a great job going back to Jacoby Brissett, going back to Ryan Finley. He's always done a great job finding kind of these transfer quarterbacks. I think he's also done a great job hiring coaches. And then he's also developed those players. But it's kind of been, if it, to me, I wouldn't even call it a rebuild. It feels like it's almost a mm-hmm. build up. Like it's when Bradley Chubb and Naeem Hines and all those dudes were getting older. That was going to be the year with Ryan Finley. Last year with Devin Leary, Drake Thomas, we thought it was going to be in a Peyton Wilson, but Thayer, all those guys. When do you think, you know, they want to win every year. I get that. And I don't think rebuild, but building up, when do you think that year would be? You know the recruiting class Mm -hmm. as well as anybody. What year could we expect them to be, you know, true contenders like they were with those classes of some of those guys? It's so hard to say, you know, because I think – just injuries and circumstance matter so much, right? Like even last year, you talk about last year, um, you lose Devin Leary in, in game five. I mean, State still won eight games last year. I mean, that could have been a 10-win season with Devin Leary. Who knows, right? I mean, I think it, because that was a drop-off to, to Jack Chambers and then, you know, you lose the Syracuse game, you lose the Boston College game, um, maybe Louisville. If you have Michael, do you win those games? Like I think you have a different perspective. perspective. So to me, it's it's always tough. It's like, can you put yourself in that position? Now, I, I think the, the concern that I'm sure NC State's fans have is we haven't capitalized on that position when we've been there, right? Like whether it was 21 and a deal where go to Wake Forest and win that game. Like if you go and win at Wake Forest in 2021, you win the Atlantic Division. And we view Dave Dorn and 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 I'm sure his tenure completely different if he does that. And so I think he's built up to that multiple times. Even back in, was it 2017, they lost to Clemson at home, 38-31. If they win that game, I believe they um, – I believe State would have been two games up on Clemson with like three games to go. Like they would have won the division. And so he's had those opportunities. He just hasn't capitalized on them. And so I, can he do it again? I mean, that's the question. Can you rebuild again? I mean, I think with the portal – and, and um, junior college recruiting, the transfer portal, you feel like maybe it's easier to, to, to get your roster back. But it's tough. Like, I, I'm interested to see how getting rid of the divisions changes things. You know, like, how, does it make it tougher? Does it make it easier? I think we saw a glimpse in 2020 when you didn't have divisions of what it was like. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a hard answer. I know from your days, Mike, you probably know as a competitor, you feel like if you can get there – comes down to getting it done right but the first step is putting yourself in that position 
And, and I think State's done it a, a few times. They just haven't been able to capitalize on it. How desperately, from just for for like uh, morale, reputation of, of the fan base, does the program and Doran, since we've kind of been talking about it, need that that signature win? Right when 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 you think of Tob and Mike, you think of that Florida State win, and and it's over the number three team in the country, and and nobody believed in you, and, and you had to come back and, and make it. There there aren't a ton of those style of signature wins for for Dave Doran. How how desperately do they need one to hang their hat on? Yeah, I think that's – I look at, like, T.O.B. with Mike and, and Dave. I think that is the difference, right? It felt like Tom would win a big game or so every year that, like, you didn't think he, he would win. And uh, Dave has been more kind of consistent in terms of winning the quote-unquote layup games. You know, for the most part, he's won those, but he's lacked those high-end – victories you know I think you go to Clemson in 2021 you, you kind of felt like you had a monkey off the back when you when you won that one but then Clemson ends up not quote unquote being Clemson right they go nine and three or whatever and, and that win's not viewed the same um I think you'll get an opportunity this year in North Carolina mm-hmm. you know you look at where things are things are trending right now with North Carolina that could be a game at the end of the season where UNC's playing maybe for an ACC title bid or appearance and, and so could you win that game Right, like I think that's the type of win that that can certainly help. And, I, and we've seen Dave do it, Mike. You know the story with Dave. Dave's been open about it. I mean, 2016, he doesn't win in Chapel Hill when they have Mitch Trubisky. He's probably fired, right? And he goes over there as a as a I think a 10 point underdog and wins that game. He'd probably tell you that was a big win. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I often but, wonder. You know, I don't know what's going through Debbie Allen's head, but you talk yeah. about big wins and loss. I mean, that's what. Tom was great for. We'd win one we shouldn't, and we would lose one that we should have won. And it makes me think of the Virginia game my senior year. Yeah. But I often wonder if Gio Bernard doesn't return that kick for a touchdown, does Tom O'Brien get fired? And I don't know the answer. But you talk about how Dave saved a job beating Carolina. I truly wonder if that game cost him his job because then he would have been six and zero versus Carolina in his tenure. I think six and zero. Is that right? It might have been. Yeah. Six- yeah, when I, I was there, so, we were four and zero, and then we lost the last <laughs> one. We were four, four and one. So I, I'm not sure exactly, but um, so I, I wonder if if that would have played out different for for Tom. Flipping it more on the recruiting side, transfer portal, uh, NIL. My agency, Athletes First, the one that I'm with, is arguably the top football agency in the world. The other day, I see they signed a high school athlete, a football player. Mm-hmm. How much has NIL? And the transfer portal changed the recruiting landscape of college football in the, in the way that you follow it. Oh, it's, it's completely revamped it. You know, I'm at the point now where, I mean, you know, you mentioned me going to watch Mike um, when, when he was in high school and Mike was, you know, I think Mike, you were what top five at your position nationally. I mean, one of the top players at your position coming out of high school. And now it's at a point where, if you're not one of those guys, it's almost kind of like, do you recruit the high school level? Right? Like you get where I'm coming from because you only have 85 scholarships. And with the way you can go out in the transfer portal and get instant guys to come in and, you know, you don't have to sit one year, you can play right away. I, I feel like you almost flip how you handle high school recruiting versus how you did in the past where you would take 25 man classes from on the high school level. Like, do you need to do that anymore? Because it's so, um, like it, it, it's so much harder to project high school players, in my opinion, than these college players who are, who are transfer portal guys. So I think it's changed in a major way. I think schools are focusing more on the transfer portal. You look at Florida State right now, right? Like they're, I think they, I think I saw they have 16 starters they got out of the transfer portal, and they're a top five team nationally. I mean, I think because of the portal, it's really de-emphasized high school recruiting to a degree, and and NIL is just completely it's the same way. I mean, NIL has made it where schools can, can kind of prioritize guys and, and focus on them. And, and I'm interested to see how teams handle NIL going forward, because eventually are you going to be able to continue to draw the same financially that you're doing early on as you had in the past, right? I think that's the question with NIL moving forward. So, so if, if state's thinking that way, right, like maybe you recruit high school less, there's probably other schools thinking that way. How, yeah. 
How important is it to make sure Casey Concepcion's driving around in a nice car and he's got the he's got the money he needs and and uh, you know the the whispers that are going to come if he's you know freshman All American like he was at, at, at mid season according to a whole bunch of publications. How important is it that that the powers that be are passing the hat for somebody like him? Oh, it's critical, you know, because I, I think Dave Doran would probably prefer NIL to be a retention and a reward plan for his team, if that makes sense. Like, you, you know, who's doing well on your roster should benefit the most from NIL. So a player like Peyton Wilson, for instance, returning to school, you know, there's a reason I think Peyton's doing well financially from an NIL standpoint it's because he what, what he's done in the past. And the same thing with KC, where if you take care of him, would he want to upset what he's got going on and take a risk to move everywhere else? Because – that's the other element of it I think a lot of folks aren't considering. Yeah, you want to be able to to go through the transfer portal, but you need to make sure you hit, right? Like we just talked about Brendan Armstrong. Like it hasn't hit for State. Look at what Devin's doing at Kentucky. There are some criticizing his play. I mean, there's a lot of players where, you know, the grass isn't always greener when you move on, you know. And so if you can take care of your current players and keep them in their same environment where they'll have a chance to be successful, I think that's the best way to kind of handle it. And, and so with a guy like KC, I think if you're NC State, your plan has to be show him you can be competitive with him from an NIL standpoint and then pitch to him, we already have a plan in place for you on how we're going to use you. We're showcasing your abilities. You're not changing a lot to where you can end up going to a position that maybe won't put you in the best position to get to the next level because ultimately, you know, for as much as you make NIL-wise right now, Mike, you know this, that NFL money just hits kind of different, right, man? It's, it's a little different. It's a little bit more, <laughs> but uh... yeah, yeah. So you got to put yourself in a position to try and get to that 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 next level. Um, and I feel like another part of college football right now, just the general landscape that is also impacting it and just different is because of COVID. How many six-year players there are, and you look around, particularly at the quarterback position. I think I saw there's obviously a record number of six-year quarterbacks, including some of the top in the country, like Michael Penix. At uh, Washington, Bo Nix at Oregon, the matchup we Sam saw. Sam Hartman. Sam Hartman and Brendan Armstrong. Um, where do you see the future of the quarterback position at NC State? I know we have some recruits coming in. Um, we have obviously pulled the red shirt on MJ. Where do you see this quarterback? What do you see the quarterback room looking like next year and for years to come at NC State? Well, I think – for MJ Morris, the next five games is an audition, right? Like to me, I was never a fan of redshirting MJ Morris, um, and redshirting him in the sense of he'd be he'd be the guy next year, because frankly, we we just hadn't seen enough of him. You know, if we're being honest, we did not see enough of him to kind of automatically hand everything to him in twenty twenty four. So while it didn't work out for Brennan, I think. The, the silver lining to that for NC State is you should know at the end of the season what you have in MJ Morris. You should know, is he our, is he my starter? Is he my guy I can rely on? Do I need to go into transfer portal and get a starter? Do I need to go in and get a depth piece? Because I don't I don't think you're going to rely on Lex Thomas. He's not going to be ready as a, as a true freshman. Uh, Cedric Bailey coming in as a true freshman, you're not going to want to rely on him. I've seen Cedric play. Um, he'll need a, a year to gain some weight. Um, so, I think for MJ, probably more than anybody on NC State's roster, the next five games are critical. Cedric because, Bailey, yeah, hold on. Cedric Bailey, you mentioned he had to put on some weight. Six 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 seven needs to put on some weight. NC State yeah. big time recruit sounds familiar, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mike Mike made the most of that of that. Uh, red that kid looks like he's probably a little better athlete than me. Though. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, let me let me jump to this real quickly because we're, we're running out of time, and I want to make yeah. sure we get here. Uh, you and the fan base temperature on, on bowl eligibility. How real is the concern? Concern, Right. I mean, you look at their schedule. I mean, it's real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just scored three points against Duke. You scored 10 against Louisville. Uh, like my concern for NC state is your, the remaining schedule. Most teams have good offenses. Mm. Right. And so you're going to have to put points on the board. Um, you know, I, I'm putting the over-under like a game and a half. Like, I think it's going to be right at that six, seven win number for State. It's going to be tight uh, just when you look at that schedule. And and is the, the, the panic setting in with the fan base? Because 
you know, I've been around a lot of ACC programs and, and state is, is one of the more prideful in their fan base. Not making a bowl game is something that, that would be, you know, I think a, a pretty, pretty, you know, all hands on deck panic situation. You know, it will. I think folks, if I'm being honest, I think folks are just at a point they want to win something. Like, you, you know, winning six games and making it to a bowl, is that really any different than winning like five? Like at this point, you, you guys know it with these bowls now. You, half your team sits out, you know, whether you go ahead and get surgeries or, you know, you may go pro and so you decide not to play. So I, I think it's more we want to win a title. Like we want to be in a position to win a title. And if it's not Dave, we're going to be talking about it here in a couple months with Kevin Keats. You know, uh, you crossed it off with Wes Moore. He's got it. So we don't talk women's basketball anymore. So you've got Dave, you've got Wes, you've got Dave, you've got Kevin, and then you've got Elliot Avent. So I just think they want to win a title. I think making it to a bowl game would be fine. But I, from the expectations they had the last couple of years to where we're talking about just winning six games, I mean, I don't think you can be happy with that, if I'm being honest. Uh, from the recruiting standpoint, I'm curious to hear your take on this. So last year when I had my little two-week stint with Miami, mm -hmm. we have a team meeting on Wednesday, come in uh, right after we go to the quarterback room, and we're all sitting in there. All of a sudden, Tyreek, come, Tyreek Hill comes walking in, and I'm assuming – He's going to want to talk to Tua or Teddy Bridgewater or one of those guys. He's like, no, nah, I came to talk to Mike. He goes, did you know that I took an official visit to NC State? TJ Graham was my host, and all the coaches kept talking to me about was how good TJ Graham is and how they're going to throw in the ball. So I was like, I'm not coming to NC State. And I've also heard stories, uh, rumors of Todd Gur Gurley was verbally committed to NC State, but a coach kept calling him either him the wrong name or his mom the wrong name or, or something like that. Who are – who's some of the great white buffaloes of NC State? Who are the <laughs> ones that got away that we end up having great careers that should have should have ended up in Raleigh? Well, you named two of them, right? You know, I think NC State, if the story on Tyreek is correct, I think they were the only Division One school to offer him a scholarship uh, coming out of high school. And uh, he came to NC State for a visit. Now, I believe grades might have been an issue. I know Tyreek, I think he went <laughs> JUCO first. Um, but part of what he told you is correct. Um, and then Todd Gurley, same thing. You know, Todd's from uh, out eastern part of the state. State was heavily involved with him. I think he was being recruited by one of your former uh, college coaches, Keith Willis, was uh, his position coach. So if anybody did anything, <laughs> I'm not naming any names, Mike. So you may want to call Keith and figure out what happened there. But – um. No, I mean, I think those are two great ones. You know, when I think back over the years, the one that always stands out to me from my years of covering state is Devin Hester. You know, Devin Hester, um, I don't know if you guys remember him, uh, maybe the best kick returner ever in NFL. He, I mean, he's certainly up there. You know, he uh, he visited state out of high school. Uh, Doc Holliday did everything, him and Chuck, to try and get him to pick NC State. And um, he, I think he gave them a solid commitment before flipping to Miami. He ends up staying home, going to Miami, has a great career with the Hurricanes, and then he's an all-pro return man. But what he could have done at State, you know, in terms of the return game, even receiver, I think Hester's the one that always stands out to me because, I mean, he ended up being, like I said, from a kick returner standpoint, one of the greatest to ever do it. He uh, He's up for the Hall of Fame. One of the big debates is, is should he get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Once yeah. to, once Tory gets in, then then we can turn towards Hester, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, what are we doing? Well, why is Tory not in yet? What are we doing? Uh, that, that that's one of the great questions uh james we appreciate you for for stopping by the pod uh everybody go check out inside pack sports subscribe do you know take in all of the the, the video and, and writing uh content they're putting out there uh you can follow them on twitter or um or x.com at inside pack sport uh james thank you a bunch thanks fellas i appreciate it